Welcome to the Journey of a Singer with me, your host, Nick Pritchard. This is the podcast where we dive into the fascinating and unique journeys of those individuals within the creative industry. In today's episode, I had the pleasure of chatting with jazz singer Georgia Cecile. Georgia was named UK Jazz Act of the Year and Vocalist of the Year at the 2022 Jazz FM Awards. Following her release of her debut album, Georgia supported Gregory Porter on tour, performing with the BBC Concert Orchestra. Championed by Jamie Cullum on BBC Radio 2, Georgia continues to make her mark as one of the finest new voices in the UK with The Guardian naming her as one of six UK artists to watch this year. In the podcast, we discuss Georgia's journey growing up in Scotland to sell out shows in the world's most prestigious jazz venues. Georgia discusses how yoga has been an integral part to her journey and shares her ambitions for winning a Grammy and performing a Bond song. So sit back and enjoy the journey of a singer with today's guest, Georgia Cecilia. Welcome to The Journey of a Singer. It's a pleasure to have you here, honestly. I'm so, so excited to have you on the show, on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I remember when I started making this, you were one of the first people where I thought, I've got to get you on. I've right. got to have a chat and discuss, because we've never actually met in person mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. But I followed your journey on social media for quite some time. And I feel like, especially over the last two, three years, there's just been so much exciting stuff happening for you. So to start with, what is it like to be vocalist of the year for Jazz FM? Well, it's an honour and yeah, it's it's a dream come true really. Like, yeah, I, I was very, very grateful and, and just excited to, to to be part of that night and part of that um that whole room of, of talented people, musicians and people who I've looked up to my whole life, you know. Um, yeah, it's such an honour. Because that, that, the people that win that award, it's a very prestigious award to start mm-hmm. with. Generally speaking, they all go on to do great things. Like if you look at the history of people that have won that mm-hmm. and the accolades that you have, mm-hmm. generally speaking, they go on to do some fantastic things. Is that a little bit daunting slash exciting to have... I guess it's almost a little bit of pressure, isn't it? But then the excitement of, my God, I'm one of these guys. Yeah. <laughs> Starts off really exciting and then you just watch your decline. No, it's, it's, it is, it's like, okay, now, I have, now the, the hard work begins, I guess. Like, it's motivation to do something and to, to, to keep working hard and to, to keep creating and to keep growing and learning and awards are amazing but they only really mean what you make of them and what follows and what you continue to do I think what it gave me was a little bit of like acknowledgement for the work that I've done till now mm-hmm. you know because I've been working so hard for yeah I was gonna say when you, when you said the hard work begins you've been putting in a lot of work to get to that stage as well haven't you I have yeah, yeah. I've been working super hard for a long time and a lot of sacrifices I've made in my life and and it was actually the first time I felt like, okay, I have done something well and I'm proud of myself. And I think it's important to take that. And because we were so critical and we're so like, work harder, work harder, work harder. But just to take a moment to be like, I've achieved something and I'm proud of myself. Well done, me. Because we don't say those things, especially British people. We'll get onto that later. But <laughs> that was a moment of reflection and how far I've come. But then again, it was like, okay, now we have to like move forward and, and what is the next achievement? What is, or what is the next body of work that I want to put out? What is the next venue I want to play? Like, you know. I had my mate on the podcast <laughs> on uh, last weekend and he was saying that the point in which you get that success can be the most dangerous point mm. because some people get a little bit complacent. Um, you don't strike me as that kind of person. You strike me as someone that... Is takes a little moment of reflection, mm-hmm. but now you're on. You're, you're thinking, okay, what can I use this award for? Mm-hmm. What's next? How can I use this to better my my career and get to the next stage? Would you say you're a little bit of an entrepreneur musician as well? Yeah, I think like I've definitely sort of worked to build my reputation, my brand. Like, don't really like using that word. You are sort of a product at the end of the day. Of the day although a lot of jazz people want to pretend they're not but I think like in order to get 
you know, festival slot or something, you have to have something on YouTube and you have to have some work out there mm -hmm. and for people to consume as well as like the live gigs and things like mm -hmm. what what do you kind of present yourself as? Yeah, absolutely. You're an aspiring figure to me in terms of oh. what you've achieved. Please. But I know that people that have followed my journey also will know of you um, but I don't know if they'll know where you started and mm. like how it began so <laughs> if you want to let us know that would be fab mm. I guess in childhood I was very much like into dancing and I went to lots of dance classes I loved like performing and although not really like the front person I was always like the girl behind or you know a little bit shy I didn't really always want to put myself forward as a, as a child but then as I kind of got older, developed my voice and not just my singing voice, but my, you know, my speaking voice and the courage to, mm. to sort of speak out. And your stage presence. Your stage I've, presence. I've often heard a few people say the same thing about you, which is your stage presence. Wow. Is okay. that something that you directly worked on or that's just developed over time as you've gotten mm. older and, and yeah. stepped into it? I look back at like, well, my family, like my dad's side of the family were all very musical. He's one of nine and my aunt, my aunties were always like singing and performing in like musicals and I kind of grew up watching them and they were always very theatrical and using their hands and I kind of copied that a lot. And then I guess I've been like mesmerised with people like Charlie Bassey, Nancy Wilson, performers who embodied their their voice. It wasn't just about what comes out. It was their whole, they used their whole body to tell the story. You know, you could see like Nancy Wilson's like skin rippling with the emotion or with the vibration of her voice. Like that was what really got to me. And I just wanted to in some way like embody that and bring that into my musical world because I was so moved by it mm. I guess so you went through the dance stage mm. and the performance stage mm. and then did you go to music school after that or? when I was 18 left school um I was doing piano lessons and like my all my grades and piano loved music but I was very much encouraged by the adults in my life to take an academic route um, and I decided to study law for a year at Strathclyde University in Glasgow. Uh, I I found this out a few days ago and I was like, oh, wow. And I almost kicked myself because I almost wanted to hear it for the first time from you. But uh, when I found out, I was, I was, I was like, I'm not going to be able to replicate my genuine reaction when this comes back on. But at the time and still now... I don't know why I didn't expect it. Mm. I guess I always thought you you would come through a really musical family, musical route. Mm. And because I know your, is it your granddad that mm -hmm. played piano? He did. Um, and then I made the assumption that you would have been pushed down the music route. Why did they want to push you down that route and not the music mm. route? I think like my, I was the oldest daughter, you know, of three kids and my parents just wanted the best for me and they were like, well, music's amazing. You can do it on the side as a hobby and continue your lessons. But you've got good grades. Like, wouldn't it be great to get a degree like that, which you could then apply to any career? Mm. And I thought, well, that sounds quite sensible. And within six months of doing that degree, I was like, wow, what am I doing here? This is horrific. Um, and I wanted to just be like studying music. So I quickly dropped out. They were like... They were pissed off for like five minutes, but then they were like, we'll support you as long as you've got a plan. Mm -hmm. They were very on board, you know, once I kind of like yeah. talked them around. <laughs> they must be really proud now <laughs> that you you took those decisions. Um, do mm. they come and watch some of your shows? Oh my God, they come to every Everything. gig. And my dad's got the Georgia Cecile t-shirt and <laughs> he knows everyone. And yeah, he's... That's fantastic. He's, they're both, my mum's like super proud and yeah, they're, they're, they love it. You can understand from a parent's point of view, you, you do want the best for your kids. And I think our parents grew up in a generation where going to uni back then basically meant a guaranteed higher starting salary. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. now in this day and age, it doesn't really, mm -mm. it's not hand in hand with each other, but it, it was a very safe option. So I understand why parents push mm -hmm. for that route. Um, perhaps it's a little bit dated. The game has changed so much with social media and everything like that. 
it's opened up a whole new realm mm -hmm. of work and opportunity. Even things like doctors and lawyers, mm. maybe not lawyers, but doctors, they're not really getting paid that much in comparison. They used to be like the big ballers, the earners. And now it's in some cases shocking how much they're getting earned. And all those years into your, your doctor's uh, studies and and then the salary doesn't really replicate what you've put in. So I've, you've clearly done mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> what you wanted to as well. You have to follow your passion. I know that's like the most cliche thing anyone's ever said. But you have to sort of, it was like what ignites me, what makes me happy, what brings me joy. And that was music. And even though it was like a massive risk, risk, right? Mm. Back then there was like, oh, how are you going to sustain a, a you know, life? How? I remember people saying to me like, do you know you've got like one in a million chance of making it? Well, why can't it be that one? Like, yeah. but even that's not that's not true because there are what so is, many. What is making what is it? Making it as well. And they're not like it was in the nineties where you had like one Mariah Carey and no one else made money. Whereas now the industry has changed so much mm. that there are so many people making a really good living mm -hmm. from music because of social media because they can self-release music on Ditto or Bandcamp. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't need the record labels anymore. You don't need that kind of, like, manufactured infrastructure. You can make your own infrastructure. You can make yeah. your own architecture as an artist and make your own audience and build it organically. And I see so many, like, of my friends in this in this scene doing that, and it's so amazing, and it's so great to see so many people finding their joy and making a living out of it. What are your thoughts on the record label side mm. of things? Because it mm. used to be, like you said, that concept of making it was maybe you got signed for a big record deal. Have you had a record deal? Have you used record labels or are you mm. like a hybrid mm -hmm. indie record label? Mm. What's your situation? Well, I released my debut album independently. I have really good management. So we got good distribution um, through Warner ADA at the time. So I had a distributor, mm -hmm. which I think is even more important now than a label, because if you're going to sign to a, a major, they're going to take a huge chunk of your music. I mean, I'm not like, don't enjoy talking about, yeah. you know, when people, you know, say, oh, well, what about this percentage? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, I just love the yeah. creation side of it and do feel like you have to have people in your team who you trust who can deal with that side mm -hmm. of things. So like my manager... Ben is amazing and really switched on and he's so clued up on on the industry as it is now and how it changes in the distribution and what you need to do to release an album, what you need to do to release a single or an EP. So that's kind of where I'm at at the moment. And that album did amazingly well yeah. as well. So um, was it top <laughs> three in the, it, it went to mm. went to third in the third jazz in, effort, oh, the jazz the, charts. The okay. jazz and blues UK official charts. Yeah. yeah, we we were like really excited and happy about that because yeah, it took so long to make that album, like five years or something. Oh wow! So yeah, I didn't actually. I didn't know it took five years. Wow, that's what, oh, since starting writing yeah. the first song. What was the year that that album came out? Twenty twenty one at the end. Twenty twenty one. Do you think that led to the opportunities? Because you. When you did this stuff with Gregory Porter mm. and you opened for him, was that 22 or 21? That was the end of 21. So I'm assuming he listened to that. He must have, right? I don't know. I mean, how that came about was the promoter for the, for his show re reached out to my agent at the time and they were like, we think George is great. She'll be a really good fit for this show. So I don't know that Gregory himself listened to it. Mm. Maybe he did. Maybe he did. <laughs> if you're listening, to Gregory. Well, he's had you live now. So. Call me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know. But I think you know. But I mean, there's always like the artist, and then these like a hundred people behind the artist who decide mm. these things. Because it, it can be quite hard to understand when you put so much energy and time and money mm. into an album production. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to track the rate of return on that. It's not mm. like a stock where you put £100 in mm. and over five years you get X amount back. Mm. With this, it, you put all your time and energy and work mm. and sweat mm. and tears into something. Mm -hmm. 
and you never know quite how it's going to come back. For example, that Gregory Porter situation mm. that you ended up in, mm. incredible experience, incredible opportunity. Mm. But that's down to a testament to what you've put in over the last yeah. five years of making that mm. album. And mm. maybe the people making those decisions were listening and thinking, yeah, but yeah. that track sounds good, mate. That sort of thing. So you never know. Yeah. That's why it's so important to put everything all the time, every show. You never know who's watching. A million percent. I think, like, I was explaining to my best friend, Lara, who's just started her own um, business as a career coach like she quit her corporate job mm -hmm. and has like started this thing where she's and she's very talented she's got a psychology background but she's like oh you know I feel like I'm not getting as many clients right now and I don't know how to you know feel like I'm, I'm afraid that I'm not going to be making as much money right now and I'm like well now is the time to sow the seeds now is the time to work quietly on your thing because luck exists where opportunity meets preparation mm -hmm. and if I had not been ready for that point where Gregory's booker was going to look at my stuff I would never have got the the slot and that gig essentially did change my career so much gave me an audience and a fan base in London you know and loads of other opportunities came from that moment but if I had not taken all that time to really mm. just quietly work and, and and of course on the the stage presence the performing aspect like yeah I had I had to have that sort of sealed and I ready mean, to go Royal Albert Hall that must have been insane yeah that was open, wild we, you, wild I'm sure you've been asked this about a hundred times but what were you feeling just mm. before you're going out mm. onto that stage <laughs> <laughs> oh my god if you can if you can backtrack in your memory <laughs> oh I remember like being really really nervous the night before. I um, probably didn't sleep actually because I was just like, oh my God, like this is crazy. The day of the gig, I was like just super excited. We got there, we did the sound check. It sounded great. But then like the minute before I was going out, I just felt like this like massive sense of joy and like, damn, like this is what I've built my whole life working towards, like the past sort of 10 years of graft and and this is what it's all came to. And I just felt like, man I'm ready I'm, mm. I'm totally ready for this now and that's amazing there's certain <laughs> points in a <clears throat> musical career where you know it's going to be life changing like mm. it will change the trajectory of mm. your life and mm. if it goes well then you've always got that on your CV now yeah in some ways it does take a little bit of pressure off surely to know that you've hit that milestone and you can always show that to the next booker um mm -hmm. It, if it were a video game, it's like you've just leveled up. Sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and after that, did you notice there were getting more opportunities coming through? Was it obvious? Mm, I think so. I think it definitely coming from Scotland, it gave me a new audience in London and mm. it gave me definitely more leverage. Mm. These bookers, these venues, these festivals are all just people. And if there is a certain point on a on a person's cv it's the same as going for a job like it just gives you another sort of leg up and it must be nice knowing that people like gregory porter like jamie cullum are f fans of your music they enjoy it. they would mm -hmm. sit there and out of their own time of day would listen to your stuff that must be a wicked feeling yeah. to know that oh my gosh yeah i mean jamie's played me on his show and has said nice things about it and gregory's been really sweet as well met him a few times um but yeah, they're both people I've looked up to for years, so it is really um, amazing, yeah. I noticed on your story before, when I was setting up a studio here, you posted a little thing on manifestation, yeah, right? Yeah. Oh, is that something you're into? Is that what, <laughs> yeah. do you visualise, are you into that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, yeah, I've, I've had a really spiritual upbringing and background, so that's been a huge part, in fact, an integral part of my journey as, a, mm. as an artist. It's, it's always anchored me and always given me when there's dark times and or where when things seem bleak or when things aren't going my way or the phone isn't ringing or you know we all go through like it's never just like that it's like one minute you're hot one minute you're not one minute you're hot one minute you're not you're always like kind of up and down but you are moving certainly right, forward yeah. meditation and yoga and prayer I've always just brought me back to my centre and reminded me of what's important and reminded me to focus on the joy of the music. That's first. Everything else is noise and, and everything else is window dressing and that changes from season to season. Mm -hmm. But the thing in the middle is the music and, and doing the thing you love. And that is a, 
The job is the best job in the world to be able to be a singer. I mean, you're bringing joy, you're bringing pure love and joy. You're spreading that to mm -hmm. people, especially the kind of music you do. Specifically with the manifesta manifestation, yeah. did you have a specific vision mm -hmm. for performing at the Royal Albert Hall, mm. opening for Gregory Porter and being known by Jamie Callum? Were any of those three mm. things an active visualisation? Yeah, I found like a wish list that I'd written in 2017 wow. and it did say like support Gregory Porter on No way. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I think I've got a picture of it. Radio, um, Jamie Cullum, you know, support or, you know, have him play my music on his show. I've always loved his show, Radio 2. Mm. That, like these are things that are essentially goals. Um, not just like woolly wishes, but like sort of aligned to the to the journey and the, mm. the path that I want to carve and it took a while to tick some of them off but I, you know I think if you just keep working towards mm. something it can work what else is on there um a Grammy that'll do <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> what? I mean a Bond song oh. obsessed oh my god um touring Japan I really want to I want to play in Japan so much. Um, what else? Well, me and Shirley Bassey was one, and I, I met her just mm. randomly. But that was just like that was like the universe just bringing us together. Like, Where was that? When I played in Monaco last Hug Me Nate at New Year. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw that photo. I think yeah. were you with Ian? Yeah. 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 Oh, that looked insane. <laughs> that, was that, was, that looked wicked. Yeah, it was a fun gig. Was yeah. she nice to you? Was she? <laughs> yeah, she was yeah. really nice. <laughs> but I was just like ugly crying, like, hmm. you know, mascara everywhere. Before or after It was photo. after the gig. Okay, thank, after the gig, thank yeah. Thank God, yeah, yeah. So, oh my God, like, yeah, I was like sobbing so, yeah. so much because she's just such a... What an icon. Yeah. What an icon. Amazing. Um, I've got to go back to what you said mm. about the Bond song. Mm. My ambition in life my ultimate ambition is to be the first actor mm -hmm. that plays James Bond that also sings wow. one of the theme tunes. Wow. Uh, no one's ever done that <laughs> that's before. A tall, that's yeah, a yeah, tall absolutely, ask. absolutely. Um, but I'm I'm all for a big yeah. ambition and working oh towards God, yeah. a strong focal point. So I found it really interesting that you said about mm. the, the Bond song. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually going to Edinburgh for the first time. I've never been to Scotland before. Mm. I'm going to your hometown on Wednesday. Nice for a Bond show, for a production where you sing the Bond songs. Ah. Um, I've done a few before. I love Gorgeous. it. Gorgeous. Um, did one at the Opera House in Dubai with a big yeah, band. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I saw and that. And then that I did, did like a theatrical one where I got to play James Bond and, and sing the wow. songs. I had, to, I had to come back to that point because nobody else that I've ever met, I'm sure there are people out there. I mean, if you're a singer, obviously getting mm. chosen to do a Bond song is one of the biggest things because that is timeless it's iconic yeah. it, it will be out there forever yeah um and generally they only pick mm. the best of the best for that mm. kind of thing so it's a really great ambition to have mm. but you're mm. the first person that's actually said that <laughs> to me <laughs> um i can see that i can see you doing that 100 oh. percent. have you done any of those bond productions where you sing the um mm -mm. no okay no, you do well you yeah. do well at that I think just like the style of set of the, of those songs, you know, it's got real like sixties, seventies mm. popular songs, but they had jazz mm. sort of embedded in the in the in the infrastructure. I think that's a really cool place to be musically. Mm. I think like if your dreams don't scare you, then you're not. Oh yeah, they should scare everyone. Unless you're in someone's mm. head, you don't know what their plans are or no. how, how they figured out they're going to get to somewhere. I think I saying think, them yeah. aloud is, and being like sure. brave to say, well, yeah. I'm going to aim for this and yeah. even if I don't hit there, I might hit there, which is still a bloody good place to exactly. be. Absolutely. You're talking about the 60s, 70s. What's your favourite decade? Because <clears throat> when I listen to your music, firstly, I think you feel this gap that Gregory Porter at the time filled for what was really lacking of a male artist. You're filling that gap for a female artist now. I was listening to more of your stuff today and you know, it has this uniqueness to it as well as the influences that are underlying. Mm. What's your favorite decade or decades? Are you an old soul? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, I'm like 85 on the inside. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, I grew up in the 90s, so there was all like Destiny's Child and you know, that kind of music was brought up. My dad is like 
massive music fan like Stevie Wonder, The Beatles but then with like my granddad it was like jazz and Billy Holiday, Duke Ellington, Frank Sinatra. I think my taste is very eclectic like I, I do love like new music as well as the old music and I think I'm an old soul for sure. Lyrically I'm really inspired by like Don McLean and people who've started their songs as poems like I do write a lot of poems and a lot of my songs have come from poems that oh interesting yeah is that your process for songwriting well um some of them do start as poems or and my pianist Ewan Stevenson who I've worked with for a good 10 years now on on songwriting we very much have like real music telepathy together like I'm really like in tune with Mm -hmm. how it feels in my body or if if something's not feeling right, I'm like, nah, that's not it. Do you think yoga's helped with that? And uh, because yoga is that mind, body, soul connection, Connection. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Has that been quite an important route for you? Yeah, a million percent. Yoga, I think, changed my life, like encouraged me to get to know my intuition and get to know Mm -hmm. what my body's telling me. and, And I've, kind of been led by that because there is so much external influence what people might think what might be popular what might gain commercial success just focusing on what your body tells you when you're making creative yeah. decisions and what brings you that moment of excitement mm-hmm. what because that creates the energy on so on the, the music that's really important yeah how often do you do yoga um i try and do it like a little every day, even just like okay. 10 minutes in the morning. I do me- I meditate every morning yeah. for 10 minutes. Do you put on a tape or do you... I use Insight Timer. You're going to mm-hmm. have to send me that. What is it? Is Insight it an app Timer. Or? It's a free app. Yeah. It's got thousands of meditations. I've, I listen to the same one every morning. It's just a 10 minute and you do like deep breaths mm-hmm. and you clear out all the stale energy from the night before and from the dreams that you've had and anything that's happened yesterday, you just <sighs> clear it out the breath because like singing is breathing. So mm. the breath work, the pranayama has been really helpful for me and building my stamina as a singer and expanding my lung capacity. Mm. So yoga, I think, yeah. gave me this sort of abdominal strength. I mean, you work out, you know as well, like how but important yeah, it is to be so strong. Important. And uh, yoga is massive for me do as, you well. Do it as well absolutely do you? yoga has definitely changed my life and i started doing yoga because i was a rugby player oh, wow. and i was like massive and i kept going to see the physio from the age of like 14 15 i had back problem oh, wow. and they're like you need to stretch more mm. so i started doing yoga when i was 14 15 just purely for stretching mm. and then little did i know it was developing me spiritually and yes. I got really lucky because I felt as though I went down this spiritual path that I didn't intend to go down. Wow. I was a burly rugby player that had nothing to do with that world. And it really, by the age of like 17, I'd done three years of it. And at that point, I was meditating every day. Wow. Um, and that became a huge thing. I still do it now. Every mor- my, my morning thing is I get up. I like to get up early if I can, if I haven't had a late gig. Mm. Um, I have a little moment of appreciation. So I write down the things I appreciate. Then I do a little mini plan for the day and then I'll do a 10 to 20 minute meditation. And I, for me, I focus a lot on the manifestation side of it in the morning. Um, Yeah, I got massively into it, but not on purpose, like really by accident. Oh my God. Um, And now I love it. I mean, I do aerial yoga. Do you? Yeah, Sundays in Notting Hill. (laughs) (laughs) It's great. Because I still do a lot of weight, so I'm still quite tight. So I do do it for the flexibility as well. But also the the mental side of it is beautiful it is amazing really 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 I mean, good i'm literally a horrible person without it. <laughs> like, but to do it every day that is i think that I really says says something yeah. about someone um, yeah definitely and and it's hard like when you're traveling a lot when, mm-hmm. when you're touring and performing night after night the last thing you want to do is get up early and yeah bloody but you know that you're going to benefit from it later mm-hmm. on in the, in the day and, and i've learned the hard way like if i haven't meditated i generally find the day a lot harder mm. and like a lot more stressful and anxiety and things whereas if i've meditated things just seem a lot more mm-hmm. sort of relaxed it's really hard as a performer to get a regular sleeping pattern but is yeah. it are you the sort of person that gets up a similar time each day or do you do it based on the previous night's performance 
You know, I love that question because I'm obsessed with ask everyone I meet what time do you get up in the Really? Morning? I think it's, yeah, I think it's like, <laughs> it's like such an amazing topic. You should, you should sort of ask everyone on the podcast, yeah. what's your wake up time? I wonder if there's a correlation as well. I'm just really, I'm your just really intrigued. Wake up time? Well, I, get, I guess like we're working musicians, we're performing a lot. So we're getting to bed late most nights. And you know what it's like after you've had a show. You go home, you can't down. sleep for oh, like okay. an hour. So yeah. quite often I'm not getting to bed till like maybe 12, 1, mm -hmm. maybe later. So generally, I mean, I set my alarm for like half eight, but I try, I don't really get up till nine, half nine, go do my meditation, bit of yoga, and then I'll start my sort of working mm -hmm. day at like 10, half 10 or something like that. And if I don't have a gig or a show, I will go to bed a bit earlier, but quite often I won't fall asleep till like midnight or, mm -hmm. or later it depends like what body clock I'm on but most and Fraser my fiance is a is a jazz pianist and he's coming in late anyway and we like to have a little chat and a little snack so and I quite like to like go to bed same time as him I think it'd be harder if your partner was like yeah you know doing a 95 or something yeah well my girlfriend's not in the industry she mm. she does do a 95 mm -hmm. per se and it's all right, but I mean, okay. sometimes I get home and obviously she's asleep, she's asleep. already. Yeah. Um, and also, I love getting up really early. Do you? So if I don't have a gig, I'll be up at five. No. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Wow, I can't and, do that. <laughs> and generally, she won't do that. Um, but once a week together, because she works in the city, once a week we get up together at five o'clock. We'll go into town together. We'll do an exercise class in the morning. Yeah. She'll go to the office. I'll go with my laptop to the Hoxton in Holborn. Yeah. Um, and it's just really nice because we have breakfast together. We're up early and we, we feel like we've achieved something by a, a certain time. That's nice. Uh, but we do miss each other. Yeah. Not the same as you and Fraser where mm. you can kind of, ru you're roughly on the same yeah. pattern, aren't you? Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. No, I love Fraser. I met him <laughs> for the first time a couple of weeks back. We worked together at a gig in uh, Quaglinos mm. and he was wicked. Mm. If you don't mind me asking, yeah. how long ago did you, like, what's your mm. story, how you met? Well, we started dating in 2018, but we we met a couple of years before that, just on the sort of Scottish music scene, booked him for a couple of gigs. At the time, it was just purely professional and like one day after I did an Edinburgh Jazz Festival gig and he was on the gig with me and he asked me out and I was like right okay let's let's go for a drink nothing's gonna happen here like start hanging out more and the rest is history <laughs> and you've got a you've got a little wedding coming up I hear <laughs> we, we got engaged like last month so yeah yeah that was that was cute um we haven't started wedding planning yet because every time we talk about it we have an argument because yeah. I want to do it abroad and he doesn't so we'll see yeah. is it is it strange to think because i'd imagine both of you have been to a fair few weddings as a performer you millions yeah you've, you've done a few yeah, yourself yeah. is it have you picked up a lot of pointers from seeing other people's weddings that you would like to implement or stay away from <laughs> on your own <laughs> yeah i don't know i think for ages i was like oh my gosh like i don't want a wedding i don't want to get married but it wasn't until i met the right person and then i decided i did but yeah, I think you just, you do sort of, you'll know the same, like you do weddings as a singer, like I started singing at weddings when I was like 15 or something, mm. really young and, you know, I think you do sort of start to think about what you might want or what you might not want. Yeah. Like the cheesy stuff. Oh. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Like the sort of like corny stuff, I'm like, nah. And then, in, oh, maybe I shouldn't ask this because I don't want to cause any arguments at home. No, go for it. <laughs> what sort of countries are you looking at? Because mm, you must have oh. performed abroad for a few weddings as well. I guess, like, my dream wedding would be somewhere like Croatia or Italy. Mm. But Fraser, uh, we both have non-negotiables mm -hmm. and his is, like, not to have it abroad. Really? So <laughs> and yours is know. to have it abroad, yeah. <laughs> so, like, yeah, it's awkward. No. Um... <laughs> I mean, we'll find a middle ground, oh, maybe. Yeah, we'll find it somewhere. We'll find a sort of, we'll meet in the middle. Um, you know, we're we're still kind of far off it anyway. We've, yeah. It's probably not going to be for another few years anyway. So. Do you want me to plant any seeds tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I'll say, I'll Aw. just be like, oh, Fraser, I went to this great <laughs> wedding like in Italy. It was amazing. I want We've thought, well, I mean, I've discussed it with, with my girlfriend. We're not, we're not um, planning wedding anytime soon. Like we're not 
fiance but um yet yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry so we kind of had this idea where it was like you could do something nice in the uk where you get all the family together and then doing something abroad as well yeah where you get people that you know maybe would like to go and do that anyway mm -hmm. there are some people that i'm sure spring to mind where you're like they definitely wouldn't make the commitment to come out to yeah. italy yeah 100%. um so yeah that's an idea we we were thinking of something like, like a hybrid a hybrid yeah, yeah do do one with all the family and then yeah. one out there with yeah close family or yeah. people you know that's I gonna so. gonna or like do the wedding abroad with just like 50 60 people mm. and then come back and have a big party for yeah. all the musicians and yeah people. that's another way to look at it yeah so absolutely you could do that yeah i did one of my favorite things actually is to perform at uh, weddings abroad mm. I've done quite a few and the, the beauty of it is um the client is giving you a, a, a flight and hotel room I know. and it it doesn't cost any more for them for my for my girlfriend to stay with me in the hotel so she comes you get a free holiday flights to europe are like next to nothing um and then we plan it so we arrive like two days before and leave two days after so it's like a little, it's like a paid holiday yeah is it, we is did it? that last year <laughs> we went to like como for oh i did one at como so yeah it's like amazing unreal oh uh, yeah you do there are a few perks of the job right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah perks of the job but you you guys are on double perks because you're yeah. you're both getting um booked That's for other true. stuff as well aren't you yeah yeah, yeah he gets to do stuff cool, it's, so. it's very nice to see that you also work together i think that's mm. very cute that's very nice. yeah 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 of course we love playing together and you know he's versatile he's got other singers that he works with i've got other musicians pianists guitarists that i work with so you know i think it's good to keep things mm. varied also what's quite interesting you have a shared passion for the same time period of music yeah. which is fascinating in itself is there any other hobbies and passions that you two share together are there any that you're really into he hates and are there any that he's really into and that you're kind of like nah oh um <laughs> i don't know how. by the way i'm not in i'm not intentionally trying to start any at no, home, no, no, like, no 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 <laughs> disputes but. i'm just laughing at like what is what is classed as like a hobby because i was going to say like watching like old ramsey like that hell's kitchen that kind of thing music is like the center of our world like we have a piano at home and we just have friends around and we have jams and we play loads like just for fun even if it's not on a gig if we're not working then we're maybe going to check out someone else's gig or a play or like go for dinner like hanging out with friends the music is what kind of obviously brought us together but it's also what we love in each other as well and he's showed me so many great artists i've showed him so many I've, you know every day he'll be like oh have you checked out this song or i'll be like oh my god listen to this singer yeah that's the beauty of being working in this industry whereas some people go to work let's say nine to five mm -hmm. as an artist you go to work nine to five and obviously you have your gigs in the evening but during that period of nine to five you're you're doing things that you're saying you're you're, you're seeing other shows you're you're building your awareness of the creative industry as a whole mm -hmm. and i guess in a way you hope that that translates in your performance in your performance is a reflection of you and what your day-to-day -day is really mm -hmm. if you're the sort of person that does yoga every day that goes and watches other people's shows that is passionate about listening to music with your partner that's going to really ripple through to the audience when you're singing to them. Yeah. You guys basically live and breathe the <laughs> live and breathe your your music and your passion, which is yeah. We, oh my god, we go to the gym together sometimes. Like I've never been a gym fan. I remember like I had this tour coming up in February, and I really was worried because I was like, this is a huge show, and I'm mm -hmm. going to be singing this every night. I need the stamina, you know. Mm -hmm. So he's like, right, going to get you lifting weights, you know, <laughs> like squatting and all that. It's Oh, brilliant. So I find it really hard, but yeah. Um, yeah, I wonder how much that actually... Uh, undoubtedly, cardiovascular performance helps with your breath control and 100%. the length of your notes, the power of your yeah. notes. And your stamina on stamina. stage. Cause if you're you doing get, show after oh, show, yeah. uh, undoubtedly it's, it, it helps. Mm -hmm. there's, mm -hmm. there's no question. Like you, you look at people like Adele and Lewis Capaldi having to cancel all these shows and then... I love both these yeah, artists. Yeah, me too, yeah. But then you think, I wonder how much of that was preventable. How much of that could be down to, this is just speculation, like yeah. how much of that is down to stress, how much of it is down to pressure, how much of it is down to diet and exercise. It's hard to pinpoint what, exactly you know. what it is, but yeah. 
I'm convinced that living a healthy lifestyle with a yeah. good diet is essential to going on tour, for example, or Look when it gets to. I know the like, lady's like running and singing at the same she's time, like, she's and like, every night for like mm -hmm. three hundred, no, it's like three hundred days of the year, pretty much, mm -hmm. doing that show every night. How do you keep that level mm -hmm. of fitness? Mm -hmm. But it, it's about balance because you still yeah. gotta go have your pizza and your wine absolutely. and your, your yeah. night out with your pals yeah absolutely I've just I've just come back from <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about that <laughs> you can tell me after <laughs> yeah we, the, the diet was not particularly good on no. that but it, it is about balance and I don't know about you but like if I've had like two nights two shows in a row and I've got the third night off I just want to like close the door mm. and hide for 24 hours and not speak to anyone because mm. like I feel like so emotionally, physically, mentally, like drained. Do you get it after a show where uh, the best feeling for me, and this is going to sound really weird, the best feeling after a show is I get in my car and just turn on the air con and I just like, <laughs> it's all silent. You are emotional after a show, mm. so you're all over the place. Yeah. That moment of calming down in the car on the way home is the most beautiful moment. I don't know why I like it. That might be my version of your um, day after, for, for example. Yeah. I, I mean, quite often after a show, me and the band or me and Fraser will like hang and yeah. talk to people. So I feel, I feel like there's a lot of socialising around it. Yeah, yeah. So I maybe don't get that quiet moment till the next day. And then mm. I'm like... Whew, been hit with a bus mm -hmm. like sometimes i'll even i can't even answer the phone because i just don't have energy yeah and it takes me like a day to sort of build up again i would love to know if they have any studies out there mm. on the amount of calories you're burning or mm. like what actual physical energy are you emitting through that process because it is exhausting isn't it yeah. not only is it physically but the emotional mm. energy that you expend. But I mean, your step count must be up as well. Probably. Like, <laughs> probably. Me and my two step in left, right, left, right. <laughs> Are you much of a dancer? I'm, well, I'm like this. On, yeah. I click a lot and Fraser hates it. He's like, can you stop clicking? Like, I do move a lot when I'm performing, even yeah. if it's a ballad. I'm like, I don't really tend to watch myself back ever because I hate it. But I did watch a little bit. And I was like, gosh, I'm really like moving a lot. Mm. Do you watch yourself back? Ever? I do. You do. Yeah. I think performers are really overcritical. That's a good thing because you're obviously trying to get better and better. Sure. But I am able to switch off from it being me where I can, I try my best to be like, that's really bad. Mm. How do I fix it? Whereas mm. I think some performers, when they watch it back, they go, that's really bad. I must be really bad. Yeah. But it's not the case. I think that stemmed from... We used to get filmed loads for, for rugby and you'd have to watch it back. So every week you would be in a room with a team. They would pull up the performance. They would pause it and be like, this guy's here. You should be here. You're doing this. You shouldn't be doing this. Oh. So I think over time I learned to dissociate the emotional connection to the performance of watching it back. Perfect. Which has been helpful. It's good to get, I think, get gigs recorded off the desk because mm -hmm. then you can listen back. I quite like listening back. Mm -hmm. I find that like easier than watching mm -hmm. but you're right like you have to separate the performance from the person like mm. that performance isn't maybe this could be better or this could be changed but it doesn't mean the person is bad or mm. not good enough there's a different oops there's a different station there yeah do you want to take a little toilet break? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm bursting from the balloon. I was like, ah! <laughs> We're back. It sounds Hi. weird, doesn't it? Chatting to you through here. I literally sound like, oh my God, I'm a, I'm a professional. We were just chatting now I know. without the headphones on. I feel like I'm on Diary of a CEO or something. Hey, like. yeah. What about the States? Has that ever taken oh, your interest? Yeah, I love America. Yeah. I'm obsessed. I love New York. I was over there last year for South by Southwest showcase. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah, um, I went in March last year and that was really fun. Like, I went to LA and New York just for fun and mm -hmm. like recreation, but I think to actually do a tour there, the visa situation was crazy. Yeah. And they're quite, from what I hear, they're quite hot, especially if you're a singer. When you turned out to the airport, were they like, why are you here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do get questioned at, mm. the, at customs, for sure. I used to have to show a pa piece of paper that was saying like, I'm, I'm not, not working. working, I'm <laughs> here to showcase and I'm not making any money here. Yeah, I know there are a few people that do the old uh, under the table yeah. trick. Oh which, yeah. yeah, but then I've heard as well some horror stories of like just getting banned, from getting banned for life oh, from nah, one of the states. Not worth like, it. Could you imagine? 
No, I'd love to end up over there at some point. Mm. Like I had a lady uh, the other day was like, oh, can we get you over for, for a wedding? And I'm like, I don't know how that works. Like I actually wouldn't mm. know how to go about doing that. You, like, it, I don't know. I Would don't they know. be able to pay you PayPal and you could go over and be like, I'm not working? Or is that just illegal? I mean, you don't want to get into trouble. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think we should all take a class. I'm asking this. you for <laughs> legal advice because you did your, um, <laughs> your your first year at law. Please. <laughs> You'll end up in jail. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know how it works to do that over there. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe maybe one day. So what's next for you? Have you got What are the exciting things that you've got coming up? Yeah. Because you've had a proper I've run of so it. Busy. Like, yeah. yeah. I've been trying to get you on here for ages and you're like, yeah. you're like I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just had a tour. Like, we did a spring tour. So now I'm just taking a bit of time to focus on my next project of original music. Um, working with my songwriting partner Ewan and this great uh, producer that I've recently met called Ian Kit. He's incredible. So this is my first time working with a producer. And yeah, just like spending some more time in the studio, working on my next project. Gabe of This is definitely different. It's a development from my first album. It's I'm sort of reinventing mm. myself. My, my question to that is, these things can take time before they're out. So let's say you make an album or an EP or something. Mm. It takes, let's just say, two years mm -hmm. for the next album. By the time it gets around to those two years, potentially your your feel of yourself has changed and moved on from mm. what you started writing two years ago. That's right. Do you feel like that you're kind of two years ahead of what the audience see you as? Mm -hmm. mm. I know what you mean. Like, you've lived with the songs. I think it's important to try and, like, find a balance between putting something out that feels relevant to you and don't hold on to it forever because you're going to get to the point where you've outgrown it and it doesn't mm. resonate with you as much anymore because you've changed. Mm. So I think, but also striking the balance between getting it right, not rushing it, making sure you do your best work, you know, and not rushing to just put it out. So yeah. there is like a middle ground. Yeah, that's something I've often wondered because um, I know people mm. that have sat on stuff for five years and then just been like, it's not me anymore yeah. and don't release it. No. And then there's this real emphasis at the moment to really push content. Like you want to get loads and loads of content out to be constantly up to date and then you can kind of rush it. I think it's important to put out little singles and then maybe drop the project uh, a year okay. later. But you've not done nothing for a year, if you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. otherwise your audience get a little bit like impatient <laughs> yeah or, or the, you can go off the radar if you're out there for too long yeah. and stuff. people might see the successes that you've had and the beauty of a format like this where you can chat to somebody mm. um is you can you can ask these kind of questions about mm. what their difficult times were mm. and really get into it if you wanted to because mm -hmm. i think everybody especially in this industry as you're saying before it can be very up and oh, down yeah. mm -hmm. and you're trying to keep the general trend going upwards but mm -hmm. knowing that it's up and down mm -hmm. have there been any times in your career in your life that have stood out for you as being particularly difficult mm. yeah like all of it <laughs> 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 I mean you only see that little cherry on top no one sees like, the iceberg only people only see the tip but yeah it has been a difficult journey it has been a journey of hard work, you know, sleepless nights, graft, hustling, like self-belief, self-doubt, and building your own confidence and who you are. And I think all of it has been about me just finding myself and finding my place. You know, why all the sacrifice and all the hard work is worth it. I mean, without being dramatic, I remember a part of me that was like, maybe I'm not good enough to be successful maybe I should just be in the business side of things so like at the time I was like yeah I'm just I'll just be like behind the, the the camera not in front of the camera because I didn't think I was good enough or because I didn't think I had it in me but somewhere deep inside I always knew I did mm -hmm. it's just about letting that voice be louder than this the critic and not shy away from those dreams those ambitions not be afraid of them but to embrace them and to mm. go for them and to believe in myself 
I think. So there's been a lot of mm. like sacrifice. They say that a well, it can be gender neutral, but the, the quote is: "You can often judge a man by the size of his problems." And I think what that's talking about is as you get more experience, yes, you can level up, but that means that every level up you go, actually you're hit by almost bigger problems. Mm. There are bigger stakes at risk. I just wonder, is that something that you've found as you've progressed throughout your career? Problems have got bigger, but you've become stronger to deal with them. Mm, yeah, that's really interesting. I think um, is that like Jay Z who said more money, more problems. <laughs> maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe know. that's what he's on about. But uh, th that's that's kind of. I mean, if you mm -hmm. take it from a strictly business point of view, when you first start out business, just a one man show, uh, you maybe get to the point where you're employing fifty people. All of a sudden, the problem is, can I pay those fifty mm -hmm. people's paycheck every month? Sure. Their lives and livelihood are on the line, not just mine anymore. And I think as an artist, stakes are higher. Like you're on a stage with great reporters. Like this has to go really well. Like sure. the size of that problem is is way greater mm. than maybe an audition for a show somewhere. Yeah. The key and the key that I've learned and I've learned this from some of the greats is quietly building your own confidence through practice. The more you practice your craft, the better you get at it and the more confidence you have. And then you can face these situations, you can face these hurdles, you can face these scary moments because the, the quiet confidence has had time to grow inside you mm -hmm. and you no longer feel unworthy or you know the, the self-critic has quietened because you've you've literally built up trust the trust muscle has has gotten stronger you you can trust yourself because you you're like well i practice for this i prep for this i've spent x amount of hours on this show of I've, I've rehearsed it i've memorized it i've you know spent how many hours in the practice room over the last few months mm. so that that for me is everything without like the practice of the thing how can you be confident mm. how can you know that you're ready I don't know do you think you're naturally confident as a person I think I've had to learn to be when I was like a sort of younger teenager I was I was bullied at high school I had to move school because I was like really bullied um, it's not a sub story by the way I'm like not trying to get attention <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm not trying to get sympathy but you know I think you learn confidence and as well like you treat it as a job as well a stage persona it's still you but it's it's less about the Georgia that maybe my family will know and more about the Georgia mm. that the audience have paid out of their own hard earned cash to see and put on a bloody good show that's who I'm thinking about these people have parted with their cash mm. to see a good night or a good show or a good performance. I'm going to do it for them. One thing I've asked all the singers that have been here is sometimes when I sing, I don't feel like it's me. Like Especially if it's a bigger occasion or a particularly emotional song, I have a sort of out-of-body experience. Yeah. And I just wonder, especially coming from your spiritual background and your practice of yoga... Has that ever been the case for you? Mm. Yeah, I love that. I love when you're like, you, you're you in the middle of a song and then it ends and then you open your eyes and you're like, where am I? Like you've like forgotten that you're even in a room and that people are even watching. I, I once described it as like a tap that you turn on and it, something flows out of you. And then when it ends, like the tap stops and you're like kind of been in a dream or something. Yeah, it's very... I guess trippy is, is the right it word. Is. Like, sometimes I don't feel like my singing ability has anything to do with me. Mm -hmm. I didn't do vocal lessons or anything. I, I often question, what is this singing thing? Like, yeah. I don't understand it, basically. Wow. And, and I don't take a lot of credit. That's cool. Um, I've always asked the guests this because I, I don't know, some people think it's a bit wishy-washy. Some people have a, mm. a different perspective on it, but I, I haven't quite found my answer to that, which is why I ask other people. Mm. I think your singing voice is obviously like, it's part of your body and it's, a gift that you're born with you know and you, and it can be honed and crafted and it 
For sure. Which, you know, I think it's got to come from somewhere. And, but I know what you mean. That's like when you're singing, be this like vessel for the music to flow through you. Mm. And I think you, you can watch some musicians who are like playing the piano and they're like lost in their own world. And that's their way of like meditating in a way. Mm-hmm. Like Fraser, my partner, he doesn't meditate. But he tells me that when he's playing, that's his meditation. And if you can get a connection to, well, I, I call like, you know, God, Source, Universe, whatever you want to call it. If you can get that connection, doing your thing, mm. then I feel that's what yeah that's what gives you the energy and the and the. That's a great answer. The love. For, yeah. For what you're doing. Yeah, I see. Uh, yeah, like my nana will go to church and sing at the church. That's probably her way of getting that same connection yeah i think everyone should try and find that somehow Mm. especially Mm -hmm. in the corporate situation where Mm -hmm. maybe Mm -hmm. you don't have time Mm -hmm. maybe it's not part of your day-to-day to to do a yoga class or to do 10 minutes of of singing or meditation um that could probably help a lot of people yeah i think 10 minutes is all you need and instead of sitting on your phone for 10 minutes you could just you don't need to like do a mad pose. You could just sit on a sofa, close your eyes, and take slow, deep breaths and listen to a little guided. Oh yeah, you got to send me that that app. I will. Yeah. Insight Timer. It's a guided meditation. But yeah, I think the human voice is the most like emotional tool, and and it can it can really emotionally touch people. I don't know if you've heard of Mabel Mercer. I don't think I have, actually. No. She was, like, one of the great songstress. Frank Sinatra really looked up to her and she inspired him a lot. Her whole thing was, like, she's almost acting. So she's, like, speaking the the words uh, as well as, like, singing the notes. But it's very, like, it's so emotive. And I think that's what Billie Holiday had. It's not really been the most, like, virtuosic vocalist. I mean, Billie Holiday only had an octave range, but her emotional bandwidth was greater than many, many other famous singers. Mabel Mercer had that sound, which sounds like... It's called a sob, and you'll probably know it's like that... Sort of really, like, operatic quality, but it's the, the most emotional and it sounds so like someone who's about to cry mm. that it makes you cry mm. um, and I remember Billy Holiday said that as a singer if you almost cry your audience will cry and if you almost laugh your audience will laugh that's great I've always like remembered that that is great I'm going to take that for if you're with me. performing a song and you I always try and embody the lyric on my face yeah and like use my whole face so then your audience mm. will be really moved that's so true i had a very um i wasn't even embarrassed but i had an experience a couple of months back i did a show at the pheasantry and it was a ticketed show mm-hmm. so thankfully everyone that's there great. i knew on some form of level like they either followed the social media or they were friends and family anyway i, I had richard hadfield come to watch and he got up on stage. I was like, do you want to sing a song together? Like, Aww. you're here, you might as well do a song. He was insane. Like, mm. his voice, we did we did a song together, and I was like, oh, my God, this is, this is amazing. And then everyone went wild for it, and then they're like, oh, we're going to do another song. Well, what song do you want to do, Richard? So we did My Way, and My Way's always been one that just really touches me. I'm me sure too. it touches a lot of people. It's so amazing. Masterpiece. And it's, it always gets me to that brink of emotion and I've always been able to control it for the audience sake of not like crying yeah and I did it with Richard and I just I lost it I absolutely we were building it the song's building and building and building Mm -hmm. and then the big notes start coming through and Richard's voice was so good I just I, I couldn't hold it back and I think part of my subconscious was like, it's okay, you can, you're allowed to do this because you kind of know everyone here. Um, I look up and half the audience is also right. crying as well. So when you're saying about get to that point where you're almost crying and the, the audience mm. will, um, mm. that was That's a, amazing. That was a real moment. And it's real and it 
oh, yeah. it touches you and oh, yeah. you just have to let it come through. Yeah. You do. I think the hard thing about that song is it, it's a song about, oh, you've done it your way. Like, yeah. It's very cliche, but I used to be a busker mm. on the streets of London. Wow. And what used to make me the most money was that song. Wow. So it has a connection <laughs> of like doing well yeah. as a busker. And I've sung it at every stage of my journey as a singer. Wow. But every time I sing it, it like brings me back to when sure. I was on the street. And like it, what touches me the most is that the general public had the kindness in their heart to give me money that they didn't have to give me that basically funded my the start of my That's music amazing. career so every time i sing that now it brings me back and the part that gets me emotional is the fact that people had it within them to give me some of their hard-earned money mm. and that's what gets me that's so beautiful and as well like the song is about a journey through one's sure. life and it's carried you through your journey mm. so i think that's a really beautiful partnership between your journey and the song's journey yeah and I'm sure it will be like... It'll continue through. I'm sure head. in like 40 years time, I'll be bawling my you'll eyes still, out. You'll still be song. singing it. Crying. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you sing it? I have done, yeah. I have sang it, yeah. I've, I like singing it with my papa, my other grandfather who, he's still alive and he loves that song. So we, we get together and we'll sing it at Christmas together. Oh, that's really nice. <laughs> um, it is, the words are just so amazing. On the spot. Do you know what I don't do? And maybe you can tell me. I don't do TikTok because oh, okay. I don't really know. Yeah. It's just a big unknown to me. Yeah. And you obviously do it. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? I know I'm not interviewing you. No, please. <laughs> At this stage of the game, we can, yeah, we whatever, can do whatever we want. Yeah. Um, yeah, TikTok for me has been my biggest platform. Oh. It's got 35 million views. That's amazing. In terms of account views. Um, Interestingly, started off as a pranks account during lockdown. So I'd like prank my girlfriend, film it. And they were funny, to be fair. Mm. Like, if you've got time in your hands to scroll all the way back yeah, down yeah, to the original yeah. stuff, they were funny. Mm. Um, and that got me, like, the first 20,000. So I already had mm. a bit of a head start. All right. But then when the pandemic ended, I was like, how am I going to turn this into music? And what I've come to realise is, and I don't know if this will be the case moving forward, but certainly it has been and still is, is that quantity is so important. Like, you just need to be posting. Every day. Like, all the time. Because it's very random. Very, very random. I've got a video on there of me talking about pigeons in Venice that has three and a half million views. I've got stuff on there that I spent two days filming to get right, and it has, like, 200 views. Um, so I just post that and post. That frustrates me. Uh -huh. that, I don't know if I could cope with that because I'm like, yeah. how? <gasps> but it's taught me not to take things personally. Mm. And just because something doesn't have views doesn't mean it wasn't good. No. And I think that's been important for me yeah. is Instagram taught me the association between the more likes you have, the better it was. And sometimes good. even now I post stuff and I'm like, oh my God, people must think that's terrible. I didn't do a good enough job. Yeah. TikTok has taught me not to care about comments because I've had tens of thousands of people comment on stuff and I got to the point where I just started laughing at these comments. Um, it's taught me not to care what people think when I'm posting, whereas Instagram is still very much a portfolio, a CV. If I someone's going to book me, they might even message me on Instagram. Sure. Um, so, yeah, it's a weird one. It's a wild west. My oh, tactic no. is to just, <laughs> just post and post, post anything and everything. Anything and everything. <laughs> No rhyme That's or reason. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if I'm the yeah. best best person to ask mm -hmm. about it, but I. W I was just curious because it's just an it's just an anonymity. Yeah. Something I don't know anything about. But I've seen a couple of your videos on there. I've got some good views. Yeah, I mean, I put a few things up when I was releasing my first album. My manager was like, "Get on TikTok," so I was mm -hmm. like, "Right, I'll do it." But then now I'm just like. There's so much to do already with yeah. Instagram. And, mm. and is it like a long video or a short? Like short, a I'm still on short. Yeah, I'm yeah. still on less than a minute. Right. I'm on like 20, 30 seconds. Um, and is it always singing or is it not? No, no. no. I put maybe like one in every four or five posts of singing. Right. 
for some reason, the ones that get me the most views is like, I'll be doing selfie mode on a camera and being saying something like, tonight I'm performing at Annabelle's with my blah, 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 bland. I'm like, the amount of effort it's taken me to do that is next to nothing. Really? I don't know why people are interested in it. I don't understand why they would like it or whatever. Maybe. So I would, I would if, you, if you're at a stage with TikTok where you like, can't, can't really be bothered, I would potentially look at just putting random stuff on there and seeing what happens because yeah. you never know. And you also never know where TikTok will go. Like if it will be the next Instagram, if you might mm. start to get bookings or fans or Should stuff. Do you get any bookings for it? So far, I've had no bookings from tic- directs that I know of from okay. TikTok. Right. Um, but it is nice for me to, to say to a venue or a manager or an agent, like I have this number of followers on, yeah, yeah, on TikTok. Yeah, I feel like it's important. It's all about adding something um, everyone's got their own thing okay. everyone's got their selling points yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, their it's brand value. Their, yeah. yeah an audience is value yeah for sure and I like I'm, I do some acting as well yeah, yeah, I put like my, my some yeah. tapes on there yeah those can be quite good um, do you think your acting helps with your singing um, no I you don't know I think mm. when I sing I'm so genuinely immersed in the moment that I don't mm. consider it acting Mm-hmm. Um, that's just my way of doing it is mm-hmm. I just have to get into the song like because I feel like I've kind of come from that generation in some which way I just imagine like I'm there back in the day like if it's a, like a croony song I'm like chatting to the, the <laughs> middle aged woman uh, or if I'm like um, I just lo- I love it or if it's like a really emotive love song yeah. get like really deep into that yeah, so yeah, yeah. I would say my singing's helped with my acting and then when I come to do the acting I try and emulate what I do with the singing yeah um yeah that's how do you balance like being an actor and being a singer um, like and getting like yeah, ahead and because i guess really both are question. different worlds yeah they are there's two things i would say about that the first is people in the singing world find the acting stuff <laughs> impressive Mm-hmm. and people in the acting world find the singing stuff yeah. impressive if i sit here and talk to you now about my singing y- you can fathom that because you've done more than what i've done mm. and so it's not that impressive to you but if mm. i say to you i just came off set with danny dyer and david yeah, tennant yeah, and yeah. filmed b- yeah. for six days in whatever you're like wow <laughs> you're like because you're not used to hearing that but if i sit here and i'm like oh i did this great show at like this you're like yeah i opened for gregory paul so like <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't say that whereas yeah. it's the same thing if i'm sitting with an actor and i'm like oh, i just came off set with danny dyer and david tennant they're like yeah like i yeah, i've done that already sort of thing yeah. so that's nice to be able to balance mm-hmm. the two it's more strengths to your ball right it is and then the other thing is the time management so I'd say the last two years I've primarily focused on my music okay. and now I'm making a bit of a switch to focus more on TV and film wow. um, because my ultimate goal is to play James Bond and sing the theme and tune. Sing the theme tune. <laughs> you heard it first. <laughs> but to do that, I kind of envisage, okay, so you get cast as James Bond, right? You do the first film, they're like, we want you to do another one. So you do the second one, and you're like, okay, I'll do the second one for you guys. And then you get to the third one, they're like, we want you to do the third one. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll do the third one, but I want to sing the opening theme. Like, you've got the leverage there. Yeah, when you've done a... The ball's on your court. Yeah, when, once you start moving that ball a bit more on your court, and um, I think I've done stuff with my singing now that's got me to a stage where I can always revisit where I'm at. Um, mm-hmm. It's not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. Like for you with what we were saying earlier mm-hmm. you've you've hit that milestone mm. with the Albert Hall and all that so that's not mm-hmm. going anywhere mm-hmm. even if you didn't sing for 10 years you can come back mm-hmm. and be like yeah I've opened for Gregory like that's with you forever yeah congrats that's why that award is so big yeah. because it is a lifetime award um it's like that old show who wants to be a millionaire you get to a certain point and it's like even if you you, you die after like a couple of stages up you fall back at that money pot oh sure um yeah yeah, yeah. so that's whereas my acting yeah. i haven't hit the milestone okay. that i want to hit yet so i need to focus oh, more on that right. um, get like a, a really a good bigger job. credit yeah mm. and i just it's been yeah. so fun chatting to you i feel like we could just chat all day we'd be here forever <laughs> is it like um, wednesday by yeah now? <laughs> i don't i haven't looked at <laughs> the clock know. but we've we've been going uh, pretty much two hours now so i feel like we could probably do another yeah, two could. but easy um, get me some pizza and I'll yeah all yeah that. I've got a feeling we'll probably um, well I'm seeing your Yay. I'm seeing your fiance tomorrow Yay. Playing, have a, a great gig with him yeah we're doing a nice That's little gig be... well we thank 
thank you so much for having me and Pleasure. you're doing amazing things including this so keep it's, up the good work you're great ambassador for all of us so keep up the good work thank you no it's a pleasure i'm 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 beaming with uh with happiness right now of having you on so thank you very much <laughs> and where can they find you social media oh. and all that kind of stuff um instagram georgia cecile and youtube and yeah all of the above all so, the above yeah if you haven't come heard about her you're gonna hear about her soon yeah. let me tell you come say hi yeah <laughs> come see a gig yeah come see a gig